My name is Will, and I, like Mulder from the X-Files, want to believe. So I've embarked on a journey of discovery. I've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical worlds. I've thrown myself into weird and wonderful experiences. I've even joined a coven of witches, all in the interest of finding something, anything, that will prove that there's something beyond this physical, three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The Skeptic Metaphysician. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. I'm Will, your host as always, and next to me, as always, of course, the lovely Karen Ensley. Karen, thank you for being on the show again today. Well, thank you for having me back time and time again. Time and time. I think there was a movie called that, right? Time, time after time. <laughs> no, you're thinking of Cindy Lauper's song. Oh, mm, maybe I am. I don't know. I'm getting confused. Well, Karen, I, I don't even know where to begin with this next guest. I know. Amazing. It'd be so amazing. I, I'm I'm truly in awe. Um, the hardest part about this interview is going to be limiting the scope of the topic. And in fact, there's so many topics we could talk about with this gentleman that, well, let, let's just, let me just introduce him <laughs> because, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's uh, a good idea. So, so he's not only a best-selling author of more than two dozen books, that, of course, would be amazingly interesting to our audience, much more on that in a bit, but also had a very popular internet talk show called The Truth About Life, which delved into similar topics that we discuss on this show. Now, on that program, he interviewed dozens of near-death survivors, psychics, researchers into the paranormal, as well as quantum physicists, quantum physicists and medical doctors, which is no stranger to us us or our audience and through it all realize that humankind is on the cusp of a transition and we're transitioning to a new understanding of the true nature of reality does that not blow your mind <laughs> it does <laughs> it certainly blows mine <laughs> well he believes that this is going to result in the birth a rebirth of optimism and that the world's going to become a better place to live work in is and that is something i know i would welcome and i'm sure you would too oh absolutely so he gets even more interesting because he's also the former principal of the world-renowned ad firm, the Martin Agency. This is the agency, Karen, that created the Geico Gecko. I know. And even more. So we're in Virginia. Yeah. And the slogan is Virginia's, Virginia's for, for lovers. lovers. And it just so happens that the Martin Agency came up with that slogan as well. Now, he is currently an editor and publisher of the Oakley Press, which specializes in parapsychology and body, mind, and spirit topics, plus a whole lot of other stuff that are more mundane, but we're really, inter really interested in this stuff. And he's won all kinds of awards. I don't want to. I don't want to de delay any more bringing him on the show because he's been sitting really patiently, and I'm super excited <laughs> to introduce to the show, Stephen Hawley Martin. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Will. I appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. So am I. And where to begin? Where to begin? All right. So, just to give a little bit of context into the conversation, right? We, you have a lot of information or you can talk very well about lots of different things including life after death right reincarnation where the consciousness resides the meaning of life uh the science as is taught in schools being based on false premises i mean there's all kinds of stuff and not to play the topic too much I, i'm bearing the lead you are actually your ancestor is uh someone by the name of Susanna uh smith who was accused, tried, and executed as a witch. Well, that's correct. Susanna North Martin, yes. She is my seven times great-grandmother, um, direct descendant. And I, you know, I heard about her growing up, and it really kind of, I think, shaped me in, in many ways, and my brother and sister as well, because... Uh, we don't we don't take for granted what anybody says or you know go along with the crowd necessarily because uh, she was accused she was tried she was convicted she was hanged and by the way that's the proper past tense of the verb to hang pictures mm. are hung my mother used to say oh. and people are hanged <laughs> you don't think about that but yeah you're right yeah but anyway yeah and uh in fact, recently I've just uh, released a book about her called The uh, Witch of Amesbury. So that was what she's called. In fact, if you Google that, you'll you can find out a lot about her. But uh, yeah, I wanted to see whether she actually was uh, a witch or or practicing witchcraft. Magic is what 
they meant by that back then. And it was against the law in that part of the world in, in New England because New England was a uh, theocracy. It was the Puritans had come over to set up a city on a hill. You've heard about that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's what my investigation was about. And I learned an awful lot because there is an awful lot of information available. Mm -hmm. All the transcripts from the trials, all the depositions that led up to the trials, pe people back then who were eyewitnesses wrote reports on it. So mm -hmm. the name of the book is the... Uh, the witch of Amesbury. And, and I say that she is the matriarch of an advertising dynasty because uh, I think that uh, having a witch in the family is one of the things that led my brother and me into the advertising business. Of course, my dad was also in it. My mother was in it. Now I've got three children who are in it. So <laughs> it is a dynasty. Wow. Absolutely. So you, you say that, that being in in your material, you say that being descended from someone that was accused of witchcraft actually helped you and your brother build the ad agency. Um, how, how, so, how is that so? Well, you know, we were always told, and again, you have to read the book to find out whether she was really a witch or whether she was practicing witchcraft. But we were always told by my parents and my mother in particular, who seemed to be obsessed by the whole thing, that she was falsely accused, that she was a good Christian woman who uh, who was falsely accused and hanged. And uh, so it kind of kept us from, from just taking for granted what somebody in authority said, that, that it was true. We didn't, you know, we always, certainly I'd always questioned and, and I wanted to find out for myself because of that. And I think that it made me a nonconformist. And, and if you're going to, create advertising that's breaks through the bowl. You got to be a nonconformist, you, you know, and uh, also if you're going to start a company, which my brother and I both did, uh, I think you have to have that little extra something that says, you know, we can do it. And I think that really was imparted by my mother who kept harping on the fact that we had this witch in the family. So, yeah, I think that it really did make us the people that uh, that we became. And, and because of that, we started an ad agency that's become just a tremendous success. Uh, and, you know, after I left the Martin Agency, I started another one called Holly Martin Partners, which we sold to the uh, Interpublic Group of Companies, which is a New York Stock Exchange company. So, yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, Susanna North Martin had a lot to do with it. Wow. Well, I loved how I was I was reading some of the material you sent over, and I think you called yourself an early feminist. And yes. I would imagine that learning about all of this witchcraft and how they treated women in the trials and everything, you learned so much more than just about the witchcraft, but also how women were, you know, making their way through society at the time. Well, think, absolutely. Yeah. The, all most of the uh, people who were accused of witch being uh, witches and practicing magic and witchcraft were women, not all of them. There were a couple of men that were also accused, but the vast majority, I think something like 19 of the uh, people who were executed were women out of 20. You know, one man was uh, also hanged. And another one was killed before he was even tried because they were trying to force a plea out of him. They piled rocks on his chest and his, oh, eventually, and his chest finally collapsed. His mm -hmm. famous last words were, more weight. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was definitely an early feminist. My mother uh, kind of instilled that into me. My father died when I was only... Uh, six years old. Mm. And she ha uh, was left with uh, two children. My brother had already gone off to college. He was quite a bit older than me. But my sister, who was, uh, I think, 12 or 13, and I was six or seven uh, when he died, and she had to go out and work. And she uh, did. She went out and got a job. She worked for an ad agency. She became the office manager of the, the agency. She really did very well and raised two two kids uh, without a f husband and sent us both to good colleges. My sister went to William and Mary and I went to Hampton, Sydney. And so, and my grandmother, so I had my sister, my mother, and my grandmother lived with us. So I, I grew, I was raised by three women <laughs> and, uh, and I figured women could do anything men could do. And I, I still believe that. So there you go. Well, great. I have to tell you, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> said like a true feminist <laughs> well, 
right? Yeah. Well, uh, so everyone knows about the Salem witch trials, right? That's what we're talking about. All these these women and and certain men that were accused of being practicing witches, and which was in the Puritan in Puritanism, um, uh, something they couldn't abide by, right? There's even mm -hmm. a mistranslation of the Bible that says "never suffer a witch to live." This kind of thing. Question is, is Everyone knows about the Salem witch trials, but is is Salem are those the only ones that actually took place in this country? No, not at all. There were uh, several uh, witch trials, but just of one individual. You know, I think there were three different ones that I'm aware of prior to the uh, Salem witch uh, trials. Uh, they were in Connecticut, uh, but that was still part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was chartered by Charles I to be a uh, place where the Puritans could go and have a country of their own, a, a theocracy. So the Bible was the law to them. And you mentioned about uh, don't suffer a witch to live. That's in Exodus, I believe. You know, the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus and a whole bunch of laws after that that the Jew Jewish people still, many of them still go by. And one of them has to do with the one you just said about not suffering a witch to live. But yeah, there were at least three trials where women were accused, tried and executed. One of them I found very fascinating and I talk about it in, in my book. Uh, the name of the lady was uh, Goody uh, Goodwin. And she was a washerwoman who, uh, apparently really was practicing witchcraft. In fact, if you, in reading about her, she was written about extensively by Cotton Mather. Uh, she apparently had a pact with the devil. At least she thought she did. Now today, I believe probably people would, she'd be diagnosed as being schizophrenic because she would be constantly talking to Satan. She called him her prince. And she had uh, effigy dolls that she used to, you know, torture people with. Okay. When they tried her, uh, they someone, one of the judges or whatever, brought one of her effigy dolls into the courtroom and handed it to her, and she started stroking it. And one of the people who had, was an accuser fell on the floor in, uh, be, like they were being tortured because she was stroking this effigy doll. Whoa. So yeah, she uh, <laughs> she went to the gallows, was hanged, uh, and there were a couple of others too. So yeah, it, it, they, it was not the only one. And that happened not too long before the Salem witch trials. And I think one of the things that probably led to it in that people were kind of worked up about, you know, having witches around. Mm -hmm. and um, And so, it really took off. There were 150 people or more who were actually accused. Only about 20 were executed. But um, yeah, it was it was quite a his, quite a quite an event. So I mean, how did all this hysteria start? Did someone just it, see something, or did someone get angry with someone and said, "No grudge." Me, was that what it is? That's what I would think. Well, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, speculation that there might have been some of that going on. But had the way it got started, there were some children, the preacher, the Puritan preacher in Salem. Actually, there are two towns, Salem Town and Salem Village. The preacher in Salem Village uh, had a couple of children, and he had a couple who were uh, from Barbados who were slaves. Uh, Tituba and uh, her husband, John. And apparently during the winter of 1691-92, uh, uh, they the preacher and his wife were spending a lot of time away uh, talking, uh, doing their, you know, their ministry where, you know, people were ill or people had to be buried or whatever. And the kids were watched by, mainly by Tituba the uh, Barbados uh, black slave. And apparently she entertained the children with her, with kind of magic tricks. She had grown up with voodoo uh, in the Caribbean and she did fortune telling and so forth. And 
that was strictly against the law in Salem and in Massachusetts at that time. Uh, uh, magic, uh, anything to do with magic, there was against the law. In fact, uh, there there were three degrees of magic, and and uh, one of them was uh, white magic, where you used horseshoes or uh, you used uh, a rabbit's right. foot like, to you for good time. luck, uh, those mm -hmm. kind of things. And then there was black magic, which was uh, when you uh, conjured up a spell, particularly to curse someone or to curse their animal. And then, of course, the highest degree was the one that Goody uh, uh, Goodwin was guilty of, which was the pack with the devil. But uh, she was practicing these magic tricks and suddenly the, after a while the kids fell ill and there were the two girls that lived in the house who were the daughters, but they had friends over uh, and the friends participated in this. So there, was, there were half a dozen or so young women and girls aging from something like eight or nine up to about 16 or 17 who participated in all this and they suddenly began to think that they were being attacked by what they call specters, specters being like a ghost of people coming them to them and torturing them. And they'd be lying on the floor, writhing in pain and that sort of thing. So the, uh, the preacher wanted to find, wanted to get to the bottom of it. And he asked who was doing this to them? Who was it? Who were, who were, who were the specters of? And, they the children ended up f first accusing the town beggar. Her name was uh, uh, Good was her last name, Goody Good. And uh, she was a logical one to uh, accuse, I suppose, because she probably looked like a witch and she was going around, you know, begging and stuff like that. So that's how it got started. But then it spread. It just uh, spread like wildfire. Mm. So, yeah. So this all because a couple of girls had a couple of nightmares. Well, I think it was more than nightmares. I think they were, you know, I think that probably they believed it. You know, one of the things I did, I believe that they believed they were being attacked because of you know when you believe something strongly enough, uh, you know, it, you can produce all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, you, you bring up a great point, and, and, and it is a conversation I want to dive into because you, you do think that those that say that the girls were faking their symptoms are off the mark. Right? Uh, so, you know, I think that probably some people during the course of the whole thing were faking, but I don't think these girls were. One of the things I did was uh, I had heard stories about how people who use uh, – uh, what are those boards called that t tell fortunes? Oh, the, Ouija boards? Yeah. Uh, and I Googled that. I Googled, uh, what are they again? Ouija board? Ouija boards. Yeah. I Googled Ouija warning. And I got like a million hits. And on the first page, there were all kinds of stories about people who'd been, been using these Ouija boards. And suddenly, things, paranormal things started happening to them. There was one lady who was, uh, they, were at, they apparently had a firefighter from nine, who died in 1935 was coming through the Ouija board and was ask, answering questions. And they were asking him all these questions. And this one lady who was taking part in this became paralyzed and couldn't talk. And her friend looked around at her and then she looked at the board. She picked up the board and she ran and she threw it down the steps into the basement. And uh, the lady was finally able to, you know, get her <laughs> be able to move again and talk again. So I mean, yeah, but those—that's just one of a bunch of stories. So you know, maybe there, maybe there's something to the idea of trying to use magic to communicate with the other side and things can get out of hand. I don't know, but uh, mm. I do know that they probably really thought they were being attacked by specters. Those well, I would have girls. thrown that Ouija board out of the house. Because now <laughs> in the and now I can never go into the basement. <laughs> yeah, I think the next day they went down and got it and they threw it in the dumpster in the back. Mm. Yep. But, yeah, yeah don't blame me. <laughs> uh, the only thing I've ever had to happen with the Ouija board is I keep getting uh, accused of, of moving the Ouija thing. Um, 
they don't, <laughs> they don't believe it's real. <laughs> it doesn't move by itself, does it? I've never done it. Tell me about that. <laughs> so, so some people think that when they use a Ouija board, you can actually be possessed by a, a demon or something like that. Is what? What are your thoughts on that? Is that? Do you think it's possible? Well, I do think that you know. <laughs> That's another thing that I, I looked into very carefully. It's something that I, when I had that um, that weekly podcast you mentioned, I, I talked to two different psychiatrists uh, who treat possession. Not They're not priests or preachers. They're psychiatrists, MDs, who, Interesting. Uh, who actually, one of them lives in um, in West Virginia, in Wheeling, West Virginia, and she's uh, I tell, I've interviewed her twice, and and she is very clear that uh, you can be possessed, and that there are different levels of possession. There's obsession, which is when you're somebody is just kind of in your space, in your aura from the other side, who's influencing you. Uh, but possession is when they actually take over your body, mm -hmm. and that is rare, but it does happen. And in fact, the Catholic Church still has. Um, still does possession. It has to be a bishop to do it and has to be approved by the bishop. But uh, they have something like a 27-page manual on how to uh, depossess. I read a book by uh, a guy named, yeah, the Mac exorcist, ah. a guy, a uh, priest who had worked in the Vatican. Been, his name was Malachi Martin, not related. <laughs> and he, he wrote a book that had case histories of five exorcisms that the Catholic Church had done in modern times. The book came out probably 40 years ago, but uh, it is scary stuff. I mean, it was very much like the, the exorcist. I mean, not reading that. If you could see through his face, you would not read that. You would let, she, I don't think I've ever seen her quite this freaked out before. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I mean, ugh, that just that, that yeah, freaks me it, out. Well, one of the things that the uh, psychiatrist, you know, that told me was people who obsess about uh, the possibility of s Satan being real and that you might be possessed and you have to watch out everything you say and and then they're kind of it's on their mind are much more likely to actually have it happen to them. <clears throat> and certainly these little girls in Salem, I'm sure were obsessed about it because they'd heard about they'd heard about Goody Goodwin just recently being hanged for it and being uh, in a pact with the devil. Uh -oh. And they, there was a lot of conversation going around about how, uh, you know, the Indians, they were worried about those and they thought the Indians were devil worshipers. And so it, it was on their minds and their father, the preacher told them, you know, not to do what they were doing, which was playing around with magic with Tituba. So, you know, I think that uh, they possibly could have been possessed to a certain extent. So would you say possession is only the only Satan? Because if that's the case, I don't really believe in the devil. So I feel like I'm safe, but I do believe in other <laughs> spirits. So if they can possess you, then I got a problem. Well, no, I, it, the you can be possessed by uh, other spirits, other no. than, and it doesn't have to be Satan, according to these these uh, psychiatrists. Right. Uh, in fact, it's much more uh, common to either be obsessed or possessed by uh, someone who is just a spirit who's kind of stuck on on the earth plane. You know, when you you I'm sure familiar with uh, near-death experiences where somebody mm -hmm. leaves their body, they see their body, and then they see the light, yeah. kind of a tunnel, and they go to the light, and then they're greeted there by uh, and, uh, you know, their father or their mother or their grandmother or somebody that they knew who's passed on before. Mm -hmm. Well, some people don't do that. Some people, eat, perhaps they're, they don't believe there's a life after death. They may not even know they've died for a while. Uh, they have to figure it out. And some people don't want to go to the light because they're afraid they're going to be uh, judged, and that, or that they might, you know, be that might be the way to hell or something. Wow. So they stick around on the earth plane, and they look for some place to hang out, and they might, you know, they can, they can actually possess somebody or, or obsess them, 
Uh, one case history that one of the psychiatrists told me about that she had, uh, had dealt with was uh, a woman whose father was not really possessing her, but obsessing her. He was hanging out with her in her, you know, in her space, in her aura. And one of the ways, one of the ways that manifest was that she would have uh, physical symptoms that uh, tracked along with the kind of problems that her father had had. And eventually they figured out that's who it was. And they talked him into going on to the light and told him, you know, that he'll be a lot better off there. And he eventually did. And the symptoms uh, just went away? He, it went away, yeah. Uh, so, Well, you bring up an interesting point then, because then the, the skeptic in me has to say, you just mentioned not long ago that belief probably has a lot to do with it. So the power of suggestion on someone's mind is pretty powerful. Could it not have been something that you, the girls that originally started this whole thing or people who now are possessed, and by the way, Karen's face could not be more freaked out as he started talking, but, but <laughs> could, could it not have been like whatever you think is going to happen? Can't we all just see whatever we think happen happen? Like, couldn't we fool ourselves into saying that that's that's what's happening here, or the truth? Uh, I think that you're that that is a strong possibility. In fact, I think that the uh, my analysis of the whole hysteria that took place there in Salem and the fact that people thought they were being possessed has an awful lot to do with their belief systems, and it could be the whole thing, like you're suggesting. But I believe it's really a combination of they believed it could happen and it did happen like you said but there were probably actually some uh, paranormal stuff that was going on that they did open the door between the two worlds and had a little you know, just like the ouija board thing uh and and so i think it was a combination of those things i do believe that belief is extremely powerful and that people who believe that something is going to happen often bring it upon themselves. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a simple example. There, the people used to think that sitting in a draft would cause a cold. And so they would sit in a draft and they would catch a cold. I well, remember. colds don't, aren't caused by <laughs> drafts. Yeah. Colds are draws, caused by viruses. That's and, true. And so what happens is, they think they're going to get a coal because they were in this draft and they get it because somehow their immune system allows the virus in. Now, there's all kinds of viruses around us all the time. And sometimes we get sick and sometimes we don't. And it's a question of whether or not the immune system keeps it out or attacks it or whatever and puts it down. So the belief does lead to the result. It's not to say that, you know, uh, so that viruses don't exist, they exist. Mm -hmm. And the guy, person got it. And it wasn't, but it wasn't because of the cold air that was on the back of their neck. So I have a question for you that isn't about belief necessarily, but it is about witches. I read somewhere, and I wanted to get your take on this, that once a, a person was executed for being a witch, that when they were buried, they were decapitated and their head was separated from their body because the belief was that if their body was separated from their head, then they couldn't go to heaven. Have you read anything about that? Well, what I uh, have read about that and have found out that in the United States, in what became the United States, in North America and in England, uh, witches were hanged. In, on the continent, in France and Germany and Spain and so forth, they were burned at the stake. The reason they were burned at the stake was exactly what you said, is to get rid of the body, you know, and, and they didn't, I guess, think they went, they don't, wouldn't go to heaven anyway, since they were right. in, in a deal with the devil. But uh, it was so they didn't come back, I guess, as zombies. Whereas mm -hmm. here, in and in Massachusetts, those who were uh, convicted and, and executed could not be buried in the, in the, town graveyard or the church graveyard they had to be they were buried somewhere else but i don't think 
that the heads were cut off. Uh, that could be, I didn't, I'd never read that, but they were not allowed to be buried in a, a spot where, you know, Christians were buried. Mm. So I, I got to ask Karen, why did you ask, ask that ask question? That question. <laughs> <laughs> Just curious. No. <laughs> so, um, many years ago, I had a, a situation, and I will, will tell you, I believe in everything, and I don't believe in everything, but I believe in you most believe stuff. in everything. No, most stuff. But, you know, <laughs> I, I do my research, and well, that's right. You don't believe in astrology, but everything else you believe in. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so I, I had a situation where um, I woke up one night, and there was a man in my bedroom with a knife, and I got away, and it all worked out for the best. <laughs> but at the time that that happened, I could sleep through a hurricane. I could sleep through anything, and. Um, but for some reason, him like pushing a button on my television woke me up and fortunately, and I was able to get away. But I remember everything about that incident and specifically what I was dreaming. And in my dream, I was in an old house. I'm not sure where, but I was speaking with a woman, who, a spirit. And we weren't having a conversation, but I think I was asking her questions and she was answering with knocks. And somehow I figured out that she wanted me to take her head and put it with her body because she had been decapitated and, and so she could go to heaven. So after this, after this incident, I woke up, you know, called the police, whatever, all that stuff. And um, a few days later, when I was a little more calm, I went to the libraries and started doing some research. And that's where I read a couple of, of, I don't know, books or articles about this and talking about, you know, dreaming. And if you're dreaming about spirits, it can be a warning if you're not afraid and all of this. But then if, I read about witches or people that had been decapitated because the belief was that if their head was separated from the body, there's no way it could be together and they could go to heaven. So that's, that's why I was asking because I believe someone woke me up and saved me from that because there really is no reason I should have been woken up. I mean, there was stuff to tie me up, a knife, like the whole shebang. And I, and I got out um, unscathed. Well, I'm glad I asked. Well, it sounds like you, that was a horrible thing, but maybe, she did wake you up. I mean, you're great. I, I totally believe, I totally believe she did, but I didn't know if maybe she had been a witch and, you know, she was asking for my help in the stream somehow. I don't know. You know, I, I haven't heard about the decapitation uh, thing, but, um, you know, I don't think that would keep you from going to heaven. I mean, you, you could be blown to bits in a, uh, atomic blast. You still, you know, the body, <laughs> That's true. That's the true. body and, and the consciousness are not, they're separate, you know. The, mm -hmm. the brain is a receiver of consciousness, not uh, the creator of consciousness. And right. you mentioned earlier about the whole uh, idea that uh, science, as it's taught in school today, is based on a false premise. And that's certainly what I believe. And the false premise is that the only thing that exists is material substance. And therefore, material substance would have to produce consciousness. And if material, and that would mean that. Uh, there could have been no intelligence, no consciousness until evolution produced a brain, which to me makes no sense at all because mm -hmm. uh, you can see all the intelligence in the universe from the beginning, you know, all the laws of physics and everything else that, uh, that would require intelligence. DNA, for example, that is the building block of life mm -hmm. has, uh, of the coiled um, the helix thing, helix inside the DNA molecule is if you stretch it out, it's six feet long, and it's 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 like computer code. You've everybody's seen printouts of DNA, mm -hmm. and that computer code like uh, thing is what tells the uh, cell when and how much protein to make and what kind of protein, and you know how could all that whenever you see computer code or anything like it, like language, written language, there's got to be intelligence behind it. Mm -hmm. Yet intelligence couldn't have happened until evolution produced a brain, if that premise of uh, scientific materialism is correct. Wow. So, well, y you have just opened a huge can of worms <laughs> in terms of the conversation, right? Because you've talked about consciousness not being confined to our brains. Mm -hmm. You've talked about science uh, based on a false premise now, uh, based on what you're talking about in terms of intelligence. You talked about where we were before the brain was evolved and 
now you have mentioned that you feel that there is evidence for life after death and reincarnation. So I, I, I kind of think that it's all maybe wrapped up into the same general principles. But why do you say that consciousness is, uh, for lack of a better word, beamed into the brain rather than where consciousness lives? Yeah, uh, good question, and and really a very important question, I think, because it all goes to uh, the reality that I believe that people are beginning to realize. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, the reason I believe that, there are so many reasons, but let me just start with uh, some scientific ones. Uh, consciousness confined to the brain. Quantum physicists don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And the reason they don't believe that is because of something that's called the double slit experiment. Have you ever heard of that? That would have not. No. Yeah, the double slit experiment is goes back more than 200 years to, uh, I've forgotten the guy's name, but you take two slits that are very thin and you shine light through them and you will get a wave pattern where it uh, shows that light is a wave. It, uh, by wave pattern, I mean light, dark, light, dark, where mm -hmm. the peaks over come together and the valleys come together you get light you got a zebra pattern mm. okay if mm -hmm. you just if you close one of those slits you will get a kind of a round kind of light on the wall okay well that experiment as i said i think it was first done in 18 of three quantum physicists know from Einstein and experiments that he did that light is a are particles, photons, mm -hmm. photons. And so what they have done is that experiment, but have a photon gun that shoots a photon uh, through the slits one at a time. Now, if you do that one at a time, you will still get, and you have both slits open, you will still get the zebra pattern. Now, how could that be? Because you would think you'd get the little spots up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Now, if the scientist has a, has, keeps a record of what spot was shot by what gun through what slit, if he keeps a record and knows, you get all the little spots on the wall. So the fact that he knows, the fact that he's conscious determines the outcome of that experiment. If he doesn't know, he gets a zebra pattern. If he does know, he gets the spots on the wall where they hit because he knows where they hit. And that experiment has done been done in laboratories all over the world. And it has been done in various configurations where they measure where the sp uh, photons came from and what, what slit they went through before the slits and after the slits. And then they've done it before the slits and after the slits and erased the information. Every time they do it, no matter which way they, they do it, it comes out the same way. If the scientist knows, you get the spots. If the scientist doesn't know, you get the slits. So wow. that's like a practical version of Schrodinger's cat, right? It's it, the cat's alive and dead at the same time. And only when you open the box to find out, do you know whether the cat is actually alive or dead in this reality? Exactly. So those, those slits are, uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a, yeah. Oh, now let me give you some more uh, information <laughs> about that. So, you're you're going to be in a flashlight tonight, aren't you? <laughs> let, me, let me blow your mind some more. Will and Karen is basically what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> You uh, live in Virginia. I live in Virginia. Mm -hmm. There's this place called the University of Virginia that's up the road from me in, in Charlottesville. And there was a guy named uh, Ian Stevenson who was a psychiatrist taught in the medical school at the University of Virginia who got interested in reincarnation. Mm 
-hmm. back in the early 60s. I think probably he he started in 1961 or 62 investigating children's memories of past lives. And the University of Virginia has been studying that ever since. So that was, it's almost 60 years. So they're still doing it now. They're still doing it today. Wow. In fact, after a few years, Ian Stevenson uh, was given a grant by the guy who uh, invented the Xerox machine, millions of dollars, who happened to be interested in the same subject. And there is a something that's called the uh, Division of Perceptual Studies that was created that Ian Stevenson led up until 2007 when he died, or maybe he's retired for a little while before that. But anyway, it's still going on. It's now led by a man named Jim B. Tucker, who is a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist. So they have been studying children's memories of past lives. And what they do is the ch child children will typically start talking about this when they're around two years old, when they learn to talk, mm -hmm. when they start talking. And they'll talk about it up until they're about six, usually, and then, then it'll just fade away. But what Stevenson did was when one of these cases would come about, he'd check them out and see, you know, the guy. And classic study, one that I put in one of my books, uh, Life After Death, Powerful uh, Evidence You Will Never Die is the name of that book, uh, is a, a World War II pilot. This kid was born in 1999. And in the early 2000s, when he was about 18 months old, he started talking about, uh, first he had nightmares and he would say that he was in a plane and he was crashing and the plane was on fire. Long story short, uh, his parents would ask him questions. He was able to, he said that he, he was a pilot in World War II, that his plane was shot down at the Battle of Iwo Jima, that uh, he, saw them on the beach at where the pink hotel was in Hawaii and he thought they would be good parents. And so that's why he went with them. <laughs> he knew the names of the, of his, his friends on the, sh on the ship who were fellow pilots and crew. He knew the name of the aircraft carry the Natoma Bay, <laughs> all this stuff. And, you know, that is a typical, but a very poignant example of the kind of research the University of Virginia has been doing on children's memories of past lives. They now have 2,500 plus case histories that they've checked out. And over two thirds of them, they say, are solved in the sense that the person that the kid talked about matches up with somebody that lived at the same place and had the same names and so on and so forth. Wow. So that, you know, does the brain store memories? Does, is the brain, uh, is consciousness combined, uh, confined to the brain? Well, if somebody's dead, <laughs> they don't have a brain anymore. And when they're reborn, if they still have those memories and they are still conscious, then it's not kept in the brain. Right. Yeah. Um, the other things that the, that the uh, Division of Perceptual Studies studies are, uh, there are two other, uh, three, three other things that they say lead them to believe, and they have said that the brain does not create consciousness, that it's a receiver of consciousness that integrates it with the body. And those are, of course, near-death experiences where people can talk about, uh, tell when they're clinically dead, what the doctors in the hospital and the operating room were saying, what the nurses were talking about, and so on and so forth. All kinds of examples of that, thousands of examples of that. Uh, another thing that they believe, there's a situation that people who work in hospice and uh, nursing homes and so forth have often seen, and it's documented many, many cases of where people who are comatose or uh, have bad dementia, 
I don't know about Parkinson's, not Parkinson's, the other one, Alzheimer's disease, that right before they die, usually hours before they die, they will become very lucid and have a conversation with their uh, loved ones. Mm -hmm. This was true of my grandmother before she died. She had been uh, out for months, you know, be, you know, totally in, not unconscious, but alive. Sure. And she, she woke up and had a conversation and died a few hours later. They believe that's because when the brain dies, it lets go of the person's consciousness. And that's what enables that. And then the fourth thing is uh, you, you're probably familiar with people who have a lot of fluid on their brain, children, and for example, mm -hmm. I think it's called hydrocephalus. Yeah. Hydrocephalus. Not only am I am I aware of it, my, but my father actually had to do, have an uh, underwent a mm -hmm. procedure to relieve the pressure of the fluid to his brain. So it doesn't just happen to, to children; it can happen yeah. to adults too. After trauma. And people who have have that disease or problem, often at least 95% of their brain is, is incapacity, is, can't function. And yet, mm -hmm. they often have normal, even above a normal intelligence. So it's not the brain that's creating that. So anyway, those are the four things that the University of Virginia uh, says uh, is evidence that the uh, brain is, does not create consciousness, but is a receiver of consciousness. Uh -huh. Well, with all this talk of reincarnation and things like that, I, if indeed consciousness does not live within our brains, consciousness lives elsewhere, and it, we're, it, 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 we're just housing it for, for the time being, and we do come back life after life after life, the question then lies, why? Why do we reincarnate? Why don't we just live, die, and then go off to be in heaven? Good question. Good question. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention that he actually gave us a lot of these questions. But hey. <laughs> there are, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of theories about that. Uh, I guess the one that um, that I buy into, some people think that, let me, let me tell you what some of the others are before I tell you what I think. One theory is that the earth is kind of like an amusement park, you know, like King's Dominion or Bush Gardens. <laughs> and, you know, when we're on the other side and we're in heaven, so to speak, uh, you know, things are great. But it could get kind of boring after a while, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how much could you do sitting on a cloud? So, wow. <laughs> whoa, stop the world. I want to get off. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, you know, that theory is that we incarnate to have experiences, to, go to the amusement park for a day because this lifetime that lasts 70 or 80 or hundred years is, you know, really brief, nothing in the mm -hmm. sense in the eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's that, that theory is we come here to experience. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, like just even reincarnation, we're coming back and we're coming back, then how would we explain population growth? Because it would seem like it'd kind of be, you die, you come back. It's the same amount of people or same amount of spirits, but, where do all the extra ones come from? Because it's just getting there are more and more people. Well, yeah, have you ever been in Bush Gardens in the summer? <laughs> <laughs> more and more people, people are coming. <laughs> this is true. Well, you know, that's a good question. But uh, it's the fact of the matter is, from what I understand, and, and this is from people who, you know, there are people who are able, kind of able to go back and forth mm -hmm. between this side and the other side. And what they tell me, uh, is that there are many, many, many more souls, if you want to use the word, uh, religious mm -hmm. word, souls, or entities, if you want to use that, <laughs> than there are people on earth right now. That mm -hmm. actually, it's kind, you're, you're really uh, privileged to get this life because there are people standing in line. Don't they know it's COVID? No. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, this is not the only planet that has life on it. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean we know that there's yeah. got to be thousands, billions. Well, we, we, they just declassified that whole thing about UFOs, right? Exactly. And, and, and the whole the whole report said there might be. 
<laughs> at least they didn't say no way. Right, right. Yeah, right. Way before. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, interesting uh, but, that you see that. But let me tell you about my theory. I kind of go along with with what uh, Edgar Casey said. Mm -hmm. People who don't know Edgar Casey, I'll briefly explain who he was. Edgar yeah. Casey was quite famous uh, back in the 20th century. He was known as the Sleeping Prophet. Mm -hmm. He uh, lived in Virginia Beach, not far from where you all are. And uh, he would go into a trance twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. He put himself into, the tra into a trance and he would answer questions that people had. And uh, his wife would be the one who was kind of the gatekeeper. She would uh, get the questions from whoever had them and ask them of her husband. And then there was a lady there, I think name was Gladys, who was the stenographer who would take everything down in shorthand and then type it all up. And all those, there are something like 14,000 readings, they called them, in the uh, library there uh, at the Association for Research and Enlightenment that's on 68th Street and Atlantic Avenue in Virginia Beach. And I've been there many times. And As have we. <laughs> yes. And <clears throat> so Edgar Casey, most of those readings were for people who had physical problems, medical problems. And, you know, he would give them a cure just because their doctor wasn't able to help them. They were still suffering from it. And he, well, it turns out that some of those problems, physical problems came from previous lives where, or it could be a phobia or something like that. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody's scared of snakes and uh, it was because okay. they, they were, you know, bitten by a rattlesnake and killed in the last life, or they might be afraid of water. And it's because they drowned in a previous life, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing started coming through uh, Casey and his readings that, you know, in your previous life, blah, blah, blah. And that's why you have this phobia or why you have this issue. And Casey was a very strong Christian, of course. He didn't believe he, he was startled when that happened. actually stopped doing readings for a while because he was... Uh, uh, it, it, what he was coming through him was not uh, lining up with his belief system of, the, of Christianity. Well, yeah. he was also an avid reader of the Bible, and he read it once through for every year of his life, starting, I think, when he was something like 12 or 13 or something like that. And when so he stopped and he read the Bible, and he realized that there are a number of references in there. They don't it doesn't say the word reincarnation, but it obviously indicates reincarnation. I'll give you one ex obvious example, and that is Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? And his disciples replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, but others say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Well, Elijah and all of the prophets lived at least 400 years before Jesus was born. So if he was Elijah, one of the prophets, uh, he would have had to have been reincarnated. Mm -hmm. And there are, other, there are other examples, like when Jesus comes upon the blind man and his disciples, and he, he cures the blind man. He said, the blind man can see now. And his disciples say, well, why was this man blind? Was was it his parents or was it he that, who sinned? Well, the man was blind from birth. So if it was because of his sins that caused him to be blind, it would have to have been in either previous life or what, something before his current life because he was born blind. But Jesus doesn't say, Jesus said it was so that the work of God could be shown through him or something like that. But it doesn't say it was impossible for his sins to have caused it. You see, the Jews believed in karma, which is something that came through uh, Edgar Casey quite frequently. And the reason that probably a lot of people come back is to uh, work on karma that they built up in a previous life or lives. Uh, so I think that 
what I get out of Edgar Casey is that we're reborn because something brings us back, whether it's uh, uh, an unresolved problem that we have, something that we need to, in our uh, that we've done that we want to redeem, or we come back to learn something. But I think the long range big picture is that it's to evolve for, to, for our souls, for our entity, for our higher self, whatever you want to call it, to evolve and to grow spiritually. And that's what we're doing mm -hmm. each time we come back. Sometimes we regress, but we might take two steps forward and one step back. But I think over the long haul, we're evolving. And that's why we continue to be reborn time after time. And eventually, I don't think we will be reborn. I think that when we reach a certain level, we don't have to be reborn. We can we can stick around in heaven. And I think probably, though, it's a choice we make uh, anyway. So that's kind of where I am with right. it. <clears throat> now, earlier on, we mentioned the fact that you thought that humankind was evolving or moving into this new age, right? People people call it the age of Aquarius. Uh, you call it the age of optimism. Uh, you think that it will make our life better. Um, why do you think that? What what Where's the evidence for that? <clears throat> this opens up a really big question here, a big, uh, uh, let me get into this a little bit. Consciousness, uh, many of, people that I've talked to, particularly uh, quantum physicists, a number of them believe that consciousness is the ground of being, of all that is. They call it the unified field, but <clears throat> what it boils down to is consciousness. Everything came from, comes from consciousness. There is really, <clears throat> at the bottom of everything, only one consciousness. Your consciousness looking at me uh, through the TV screen, uh, computer screen, uh, me looking at you, we're each conscious, but it's the same consciousness. Now, we think it's different, a different consciousness, that we each have our own unique consciousness because we have an ego, we have memories that have built up uh, over, we have you could call it the soul or the entity of, you know, the many past lives that we've lived that is all part of our being. But at the very back of our minds, there's this thing that I call the silent observer, that when you step back, <clears throat> you can actually look at and, um, and think about your own thoughts. You can sort of figuratively step outside yourself and watch you go about your activities. And that is the one consciousness that we all share. And mm -hmm. so, in effect, and people who have, and I've had this experience where you you suddenly feel that you're you're have merged, your consciousness has merged with the universal uh, consciousness, and that you can you, that you know everything that you. <laughs> it's very hard to describe, but that you're you're part of everything. And when I had this, it didn't last very long, it lasted for a couple of minutes, but I was on, in my backyard lying on a chaise lounge and suddenly it was like, and I could, everything, the, the leaves on the trees, the bushes, the uh, it had an aura to it. And it's like I merged with it and I was part of it. I was all one, I was it. And then of course it went away. Well, that is who we each are, really. We're all that one consciousness, but we're experiencing ourselves because we've evolved this, this uh, mind and this ego. The ego is, think of how much trouble your ego can get you in. <laughs> oh my God, <goodness. laughs> uh, I'd rather not, thanks. <laughs> well, and, but the ego is not you because you know, when somebody insults you, for example, your ego says, you know, get back at them. Well, mm -hmm. you can stop yourself and say, you know, hey, ego, cool, cool it. Well, well, that's the higher self that's that's talking to you then. Mm -hmm. it's And so that's who we are. We're all one. And you've heard this before many times, I'm mm -hmm. sure. We're all one. And, and, and you can maybe accept that intellectually. 
But when you have the experience, as I was talking about, then you know it on a knowing basis, not just intellectually. Well, and it, that is what we're evolving toward, the realization that we're all one. And when that becomes widespread, the world has got to become a better place because they're going to be nicer to each other. We're not going to be going around knocking on doors and killing people, you know, uh, like they're doing over in Afghanistan. So, yeah. Well, it, it explains a lot if you think about it. Um, what is that phrase? There are no original ideas. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, we're all, you, the whole universal mind. We're all connected to it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I I've been out to the School of Metaphysics in uh, Missouri a few times, and they have people who do the same thing that Edgar Casey did, where mm -hmm. they go into a trance and you can ask ask them any question. And what they believe, and I think it must make sense, they're connecting to the Akashic, Kasha, mm -hmm. the Akashic record, which is the big mind. And and we're all connected to it. It's just that we don't haven't uh, developed that ability to tap into it. But theoretically, we could. Wow. And, and that's where intuition comes from. That's when you had that... Uh, intruder in your home with the uh, in your bedroom with the knife and, and all that the little lady with the, didn't have a head was probably <laughs> part of you telling you to wake up because maybe, yeah. there's a problem because <laughs> at a deep level you knew that was going on maybe i was decapitated in a past life and, and maybe okay. that was actually your your reincarnated self your past life coming back and saying hey wow Get it out. opens up so many different doorways. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It really yeah. does. Wow. Well, th this hour has absolutely flown oh by. Um, your newest book is The Witch of Amesbury, Matriarch of an Advertising Dynasty. But you've written all kinds of books, including uh, Afterlife, The Whole Truth, The Secret of Life, and The Beginning of Time, ESP, How to Develop the Sixth Sense. I mean, all of these books that, 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 are under your authorship is super impressive. And uh, I'm going to lay in all of those links. Uh, I'm going to try to see if I can find as many as I can and lay in direct links for, for the books uh, in our show notes. Yeah, well, let me tell you, Will, that's right. And, and a simple way to get to them all would be just to go to my website, mm -hmm. which is shmartin, S-H-M-A-R-T-I-N.com. And... At the top on the, in the menu, there, it says books. Click on that, and it'll go to a page that you'll see all the covers, and you can click on any of the covers and find out more about each one. And I'm going to buy them if you want. <laughs> well, I have to say on a personal note, I have just started looking at The Witch of Amesbury, and I'm already sucked in, So, <laughs> which is perfect because I finally finished a book. Yeah, that's taken me forever to read. I need a new one. So, so now you've got one. I'll yeah. be reading that in a couple of days. Well, uh, that's amazing. SHMartin.com is the website. It was really urge you to uh, take a look because I know there's at least three or four books that I personally am going to buy because mm -hmm. I'm super interested in this stuff. Now, if someone wanted to reach out to uh, connect with you, is there a way that they can do that? Well, that also on my website, there's a contact page and uh, I'll get the email and I'll answer it. I, I I love to uh, talk to people who are interested. So yeah, send me an email through my uh, web website. Uh, just hit on the contact page, and you'll see the form will come up, and you you know fill it out, and I'll answer you. Great. Oh, that's great. So you've got a big brain to pick. <laughs> I'm like, there's a lot of information <laughs> a in there. A lot of information. Yeah. I've, I've made some good friends that way that have contacted yeah. me that way. There's a gentleman in France that I'm I correspond with almost once or twice a month who has who's really into all this sort of thing and he's told me some interesting stories so wow. yeah please do get in touch with me and you know i've got an idea i think at some point i'd love to do some sort of facebook live with you or instagram live or uh, even a clubhouse or something that maybe answers some people's questions because you do you have so much information about everything I mean, it's not just one little one one not modality. One it's like you, you can talk about witchcraft. You can talk about the Salem witch trials. You can He's talk about reality. Shop. It really <laughs> is. So uh, I hope maybe someday you uh, we can connect and you'd be open to to maybe answering some questions from the audience because you are a wealth of information. Well, I'd love to, Will. Let me know when you want to do it. Absolutely. I, I definitely will. Thank you for, for being open to that. Uh, mm -hmm. I will lay all the links that we talked about in the show notes. So if you are looking to find it, if you miss it, 
uh, you can always go to skepticmanifestation.com. All of those links are direct links to the websites and books that we talked about. So don't hesitate. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm I'm awed uh, and humbled that you decided to to come on our little show. So thank you. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for having me. Right. And and Karen, thanks for being a part of this particular journey. I don't know if I could have done it without you. Oh, well, this has been fantastic, and I'm actually excited to go finish reading that book. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so she's saying, questions. close it up, Will, because I'm going to go <laughs> read, read that book. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, and, and thank you, listener, for coming along on this journey of discovery with us. Uh, we'd love to continue the conversation with you on Facebook and Instagram, so please feel free to find us there under Skeptic Metaphysician or at skepticmetaphysician.com, where you can find direct links not only to our social media platforms, but also to all of our past guests and their books. As always, if you know someone that would benefit from hearing the messages that we shared on this show or any of our others, I hope you'll consider sharing us with that person. It'll help grow the show and may just help someone else come to terms with the fact that we are so much more than just this three-dimensional body that we inhabit. Now, do you miss any of our show today? Not to worry. Just because you're listening to it on the radio does not mean that you can't hear the past episodes. All of our shows, including this one, can be found on that skepticmetaphysician.com and for a limited time, you can now enjoy all kinds of discounts from some of our past guests on their services just by signing up as a member. Membership, it's free, and you'll get all the added benefits of the discounts as well as a chance to never miss a show immediately once it's been published. You'll gain access to all, all of our in-depth articles on the topics, and you can even subscribe to the show or leave us a review or voicemail directly on the site. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we have. Sadly, that's all we have for now. Thanks again for joining us on this journey of discovery, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care. Uh -huh.